thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me and thanks for the opportunity to comment on what is by all means a very exciting research agenda. I'm looking into a number of very tired faces, so I promise you I will be relatively brief. I will just have three points I want to get across. Uh, but I should say as, as a starting point and understanding where I'm coming from, I'm still very passionate about this research agenda. I've started it in 2008. In fact, I was here in 2009 with Jim Brumby and we presented our uh, framework paper at the time. Um, and it introduced a lot of these notions we are debating right now, you know, the separation between uh, capacity and capabilities, uh, the, the functions that are important. Uh, and most importantly, I think it was for the first time an engagement was trying to present a view, a political economy view to the issues of strengthening uh, public finance agencies. And so uh, listening to Richard, who took this work on and, and, and continued and published it in 2012, and now listening to, to Philip, uh, seeing how he refines this kind of framework and how he grapples with these issues is very satisfying. It's, 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 it's really in inspiring. And I, I would actually say that uh, I hope <laughs> that we're sitting here in two years from now uh, and uh, you know, we are seeing how this work has grown and, and, and we're feeling increasingly comfortable with it. Now, I would not have taken a flight for 24 hours from Australia just to come here to, uh, to give praise. And, and given that uh, I'm a German, you know, a critique uh, comes for free. Um, <laughs> I just want to say uh, two things uh, before I start. And, and, and these are the following. First of all, I want to make some broad, sweeping comments here just to wake you up a little bit. Um, I think it will sit quite uncomfortably with many of you. That's okay, I can take it. Uh, I will also put on the head of a political sociologist tonight, uh, simply because uh, Carlos has done such a good job of being the economist. I want to be a political sociologist tonight. Uh, and I want you to understand that what I'm going to say is in reaction to a research agenda I'm highly sympathetic to. Yeah? Now, the first point I want to get across and this is a very important one, and many of you will think this is now getting crazy, uh, is that I think <coughs> we should raise the issue of how do we actually study ministries of finance, methodologically. In other words, I'm always surprised how little we actually give reflection on some of the ontological and epistemological foundations of our research. I will be more pointed here. I think that willingly or not, many of us, when we engage in this kind of work, we are applying a positivist scientific template. In fact, a template that is still grounded by and large in new institutional economics. What do I mean by that? I think we assume that the world that we are studying is real, it can be observed, it can be measured. In fact, as you have heard this morning, we seek to create variables that can be measured, that can be operationalized, that we can ultimately compare. We like doing indexes, as Carlos said this morning. We come with very strong assumptions. We think that actually the actors are rational and that the incentives that are given by the institutions will shape the behavior of these kind of actors. This is a scientific approach, it's a positivist approach, and I would actually say at times it's a normative agenda in the cloak of a scientific research agenda. Now, I will be more precise here uh, in what I mean. I actually have my strong doubts that going along this line in the long run will actually reveal the kind of insights we are looking for. And I will give you three arguments for it. First of all, I think we have it to admit, and actually many of us agree, that the kind of ministries of finance we are looking at are operating by and large in hybrid in, uh, environments where the formal and the informal is almost inseparable. In other words, putting limits, this puts already strong limits to our arguments about rationality, incentive structures, and the power thereof. I would argue that understanding a ministry of finance is largely understanding <coughs> relational relationships. In other words, there is a strong interaction effect going on here between <coughs> actors, environments, and I would even say artifacts in the kind of organizations that we're looking at. I would argue this is not accessible to us sometimes as external observer. Third point to make is it's process-oriented rather than static. In other words, we are looking for notions of how organizations gain coherence, consistency, how they bestow qualities and motivations upon actors, and how they organize and convert over time. Subcultures are really important. Remember, we had a quote here from Wildavsky earlier. Heckler and Wildavsky at the time, looking at the UK Treasury, wrote, the civil service in the UK Treasury is one part occupational classification mm -hmm. and three parts state of mind. There is a constructed reality here that, again, is not fully accessible to us as external researchers. And I would urge you actually to go back to the 1970s literature for those who weren't born at that point in time and look at the book, The Private Government of Public Money. The first four chapters are awesome chapters in the sense that they say, chapter one, kinship and culture, the expenditure community, chapter two, the nuclear family, the treasury, 
Chapter three, village life and the civil society. And I could go on and on and on. The point I want to get across, my first point I want to get across is the following. There are different tools we can bring to bear. The type of tools of research methods we use are an outcome of our world view of how we understand interconnections, how we understand that actors interact with each other and institutions are born. I would urge you to give greater attention, and this is a notion I want to get across to Philip, to different forms of research methods. <laughs> Discourse, <laughs> analysis, narratives, technocratic actors, all these matter because they're as much binding as the institutions we love so much. First point. Second point, and this is also a very important <coughs> point, and this is a very broad point, but I will try to keep it very uh, uh, quick. And I think this is a point that Adnan raised this morning. I think we need to sharpen our understanding of the macro level conditions under which capable institutions emerge in the first place. And what I mean about this is, under what conditions do these economic institutions, financial institutions emerge, and under what conditions are they actually sustained? And so we have, over the last five, six years, read a number of big books on that topic, the political origins uh, of uh, developmental states, uh, of development in general, of political development, the North Weingast framework, for instance, the Fukuyama framework, the Ajumoglu framework. But I would like to see from you, Philip, and others working in this area, I would like to see how can we make this kind of literature, the big <coughs> macro sociological literature, actually workable for us as part of our endeavor with ministries of finance. And I have two suggestions for you, actually, on that matter. The first suggestion I would like to make is, and I'm a big fan of this, and I'm sorry I'm biased here, is Mushtaq's Khan work on political settlements. So here's a notion of someone who looks around and says, how come that similar institutions perform so differently. And I think Mushtaq Khan's answer, in a nutshell, is a complicated answer, but it's one in which he says they work well in moments where the power is aligned with the institutional setting. And so he says then, well then, let's look at the Ministry of Finance, I think, I'm now talking for Mushtaq Khan, uh, and let's understand what type of <coughs> coalition is in power and how this coalition is interacting with their followers, which is so critical to the enforcement component. So Carlos told us this morning, it's all about political equilibrium. And then he took us further and said, well, hold on a minute. There is an equilibrium situation, but sometimes it's not enforced, it's not, it's not adhered to. I think the answer is actually found in this kind of macro sociological way. And I will just add one more point, because I'm also running out of time on that notion. Is there's a very interesting paper, Badona and uh, then Slater and so on, written in 2007, if I'm not mistaken, on the developmental states in East Asia. Right? Yesterday we had a discussion, I think Paolo said this, he said, well, the South Korean model is an exceptional model. They transformed in relatively quick periods of time. And I think what Dona and Slater and others are doing is now to say, hold on a minute. The East Asian model was a unique circumstance. A circumstance where you not only had a broad coalition in power, but you had also essentially conditions of security threats, you had conditions of hard budget constraints, no abilities uh, for, for resource use, and so on and so forth. So under conditions where the coalition is broad, where we are not able to sustain the side payments that are necessary to keep it together, where we can't go into resource abundance to finance these kind of side payments, under these conditions, Donor <coughs> and Slater would say, actually engage we in institutional upgrading. And I think this is an important part because we still get puzzled and wonder why was there a transformation happening in South Africa in 96? Why was there something happening in Uganda at a certain point in time? But in other moments, it's not happening. And if you think about the graph that Philip just presented, there is that link to the security nexus. There is that link of not being able to sustain these side payments. And this is, again, the macro sociological view that I think <laughs> we have to understand. We're in the middle of a paradigm change from institutions matter to the politics matter. Adnan was asking, what does that actually mean? I think it means to understand the deeper power <coughs> relationships. I think it means to recognize that rents, and this sits very uncomfortably with the PFM communities, are necessary to sustain and transform institutions. It's not a bad thing per se. And if we are serious about it, I think it has implications for our agenda. Last point. I want to get across, and this is a bit unthought of, but, but let me still try it. And this is, I think, I want to engage you, Philip, more on the notion of what are actually capabilities, okay? And uh, Richard, by the way, same. I mean, you, you have done a great job of defining it and so on and so forth. But I think we can probably go on forever in defining these kind of capabilities, and there will be another category that is important. 
I think what I found quite stimulating for myself, and this is just recent, so forgive me if I'm not very clear on that point, is actually some of the literature coming from strategic management on what is called dynamic capabilities. Okay? And here is essentially a notion where we separate the competencies, which I define as the clusters of specific assets that, are, uh, that enable an organization to do distinctive things, and the actual capabilities, which is the routines which enable the organizations to integrate, build, and reconfigure these kind of competencies. Mm -hmm. And so here is what I want to get to. The point is that a specific dynamic capability which we often do not look at is learning, adaptation, and experimentation. And you might remember that Land Pritchard in 2013, just recent, wrote a paper, and there's a paper earlier with Matt Andrews on that topic, in which they essentially use a, a new term, problem-driven iterative <laughs> adaptation. And this is the same point that I'm trying to make, or the strategic uh, management literature is trying to do, that we need to enable institutions to be problem-driven, locally driven, that they encourage positive deviance, in other words, that you give mm -hmm. room for experimentation, that you improve your learning, and then spread it through communities uh, uh, of, of learning through these kind of institutions. So in other words, identifying what are actually your dynamic capabilities, enabling these kind of uh, capabilities, and this is a leadership aspect, and managing them between control and, um, and actually uh, uh, allowing the space to flourish. And this is then the question I have to the panel, is essentially, is that dynamic capability, which is so important, we all agree on that, which actually could make the Ministry of Finance a really exciting institution. Is there something about Ministries of Finance that doesn't allow this kind of capability to emerge? Because our culture in the Treasury, in the Ministry of Planning and so on, is a culture of control mm -hmm. and risk mitigation. And if that is so, again, this has implication for the way how we think about you know, reforming and transforming Ministries of Finance. So le let me leave it here um, and, and <laughs> open it up to the floor and okay. the panel. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And I see a number of hands shooting up. Um, gentleman at the back, is someone at the back? 